Hello there, oh, Chris hey. Anderson. Yeah, I'm oh. come on, come on, get on it. Hello, oh, this is Chris <laughs> Anderson in London. Calling Chris Anderson in London. Now I'm behind you. So. He is, and, and Colin McBuyer in Chicago. In Chicago, oh, and you are that. just back. Like, like I can still see yes. the the burrs of Scotland. Yeah, right, you, can, you can hear the haggis coming out of my mouth. And the, the no. Scottish pipes are playing. You, they, what, what they, they you were. Scotland I was in again? Scotland to see the mighty, 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 mighty Rangers. We are the people. Crush uh, hearts at uh, Ibrox Stadium. That was super fantastic. So oh, I it's good. It's great. Uh, it's good. Saw some friends of mine and my bus driver on the scotland trip and we went to the abrox and it was it was it was magic and then awesome. lots, lots of pubs and fish and chips and yeah good awesome well welcome back and welcome Thank everyone you. to history happy hour and a special thanks to Stephen ambrose historical tours for helping to bring you this show and check out their rich offering of military history tours at history uh, at no not at historyhappyhour.com <laughs> at Stephen ambrose tours.com don't tell them that yet <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know if you're watching live, watching on replay, or listening on the HHH podcast. podcast. Uh, but whatever, however you find your History Happy Hour, we are glad you are here. And today, we are going to welcome back our five-time guest. Our man, five, the our legend. Five-time yeah. guest, Joe Belkowski. And uh, we're 29th Division History. We're really, really excited that Joe's going to be here. So let us know. Who's here? Let us know you're there. Tell us what you're drinking. And Chris, tell us, tell me some of the people who are, who are with yeah, us. Yeah, well, 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 Frank is joining us from uh, sunny southeastern Mass. Uh, Ken's from uh, joining us from Kansas. Brian Sabo from Pennsylvania with an appropriate uh, 29th Division patch picture by his name there. Ooh, anybody uh, else? Yeah, Donna from uh, Alabama. Uh, and Ballard, Brian from, well, with an Aperol Spritz, not from an Aperol Spritz, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and Brian Peacock I'm is with there. us, and uh, Brian's an old 29er, so it's good to see him back. Oh, fantastic. Susan, so yeah. Oh, yeah. excellent. Well, I want to thank all of you guys for joining us, and of course, we want to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon, especially our top shelf That's patrons. Bad. Did mail out a couple of hats this week to oh. uh, to Marcus and to, oh my God, you know, every time I do this, I forget who the other hat went to, but uh, uh, sent them out. It'll, it'll occur to me eventually. And I'll yeah, are we going to, are we going to tell people what we're going to do with all of our money? Oh, we're going to buy yeah. a team, right? We're going to buy one of the, one of the uh, teams in like the seventh league of, of what sport football. See, so there, there'll be Wrexham. So when you're done watching Wrexham on HBO, there'll be the history happy hour team. We the don't history know happy hour team. We're going to design special tops and okay. Fine. Now we are really now getting into a wasteland here, Chris, where I Sorry. really don't want to go. All right. So give me a cue and let's get out of this wasteland and into the show. All right. bar is open the bar is open you have to tell me what's on tap and you have to cue me when do i play the very special animation that i have <laughs> okay well what's on tap this week is again you know you've already alluded to this uh we are really excited to have um a fantastic historian great author good friend of the show joe balkowski uh and he's going to come back to join us to continue the discussions that we've been having following the 29th division uh, all the way from Omaha, Omaha Beach uh, across Europe. So uh, the next uh, installment of that story is Joe's book, Our Tortured Souls, uh, the 29th Infantry Division in the Rhineland from November to December 1944. And I think it's a really fantastic and important book because it talks uh, about a part of um, the, the fighting in the ETO that really gets overlooked uh, far too much. And Joe just nails it as always. Uh, but before we do that, as I said, uh, he's one of our favorites. He's an old friend, and he's the first time five five time appearance historian. <laughs> you are Joey. He's very impressed. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and do you do you have? We have to have a ceremonial uh, oh, all right, yeah. wearing oh, yeah. of the hats. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, God. There we go. How is that? So See? you're seeing it here, folks. Very first, to have this first time ever, Joe's the first guest with <laughs> a, a hat. With a hat. It's probably the first time Chris Anderson has worn this hat. 
It is actually maybe first, first or second yeah. time, but yeah. we are we are all here now. You can remove your. Did you guys get okay, all okay. the pictures you want? Pictures, pictures, yeah, take them. Go. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Remove your hats, right. and uh, we'll, <laughs> oh my gosh, we'll get on with the show. Joe, are you? Yeah. You got a, something to drink there with you today? I do I have my twenty nine? Let's go. Very cherished twenty ninth Infantry Division right. twenty nine. Let's go mug. Nothing special in it, but it's the mug that's special. It's the it's mug, mug that makes it special. How, how about you, Chris? Are you are you re in recovery mode? So you're just drinking water. Oh no, no, I've got the the last of the Glen Turret. Oh, so I, I got go some, some McCallum's Twelve in honor of uh, your, uh, your you. trip there. So uh, we're happy to do that. Uh, I'll let you take it away with the questioning of the interrogation of uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, of I, our I, first five time guest. I'm just very excited about. This. I know you are. You've been working on that all week. Yeah. Um, so I can play it again I, anytime. <laughs> this is going to step back a bit, but I think uh, it would be helpful since we are following the 29ers from the, from the beach uh, all the way to the end. Without sounding too corny, Joe, where do we leave these guys off? I mean, that we're we're we're. We, you know, we I know we were in Brest. They started to fight, fight, um, fight east. So where where are they at before we get to what we're we're talking about tonight? Well, they uh, the 29th division, along with many other divisions, moved into the western Germany uh, near the Limburg area of Holland, which is that appendix that sticks down yep. in the Netherlands. And uh, we left the division in early November 1944. Uh, in a relatively stagnant position, they had held this position about a month and a half uh, in conditions that, you know, that were very difficult that we'll we'll talk about in this show. Uh, but yeah. we, the, the book, Our Tortured Souls, opens on November 16th with what was supposed to have been the ultimate offensive that was going to bring Nazi Germany to its knees and win the war. Yeah. Didn't work. Bring the boys. We'll talk about that. Bring, yeah. bring the boys home by Christmas. Yeah. So, so um, uh, I'm sure that many of the people in our audience are very familiar with the the story of the 29th. But can you recap very briefly? You know, they 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 begin on the morning of June 6th on D-Day, and uh, they've had a pretty rough war up to this point. Can you kind of give us a little sense of that? Yeah, I mean, they were in from day one in the European theater. They landed in uh, on the western half of Omaha Beach on D-Day, fought through Normandy for nine weeks, uh, You know, thought they'd get a break. Instead, they moved into Brittany to seize the very significant harbor of Brest. That took another 2,600 casualties and, and almost a month moved by truck and cattle car in 500 miles into Holland and then subsequently into Western Germany and fought a very depressing uh, kind of delaying, uh, you know, what, what, you know, a diversionary action throughout the month of October that gained nothing and, 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 and again, lost a couple of thousand men for no real purpose waiting for the moment at which the, my book opens in November that was going to be the concerted effort by three U.S. armies, the the third under Patton down in Lorraine, uh, which opened its attack on November 8th. First Army, which, as you know, pushed into the Hurtgen Forest with uh, difficult results there. And then the Ninth Army, in which the 29th Division was a part, supposed to push to the Rhine by Christmas. And so the division, Rick, as you had said, had a very tough war. I mean, it, it was in the thick of it from day one, and they had already lost uh, more men in the European theater than any any division in action. 16,000 uh, casualties. That was yeah, but it ultimately would end up being 23,000. But, you know, they, as, as we'll learn, the division was very fortuitously spared the Battle of the Bulge. <laughs> well, uh, well, I mean, just, just to give people a sense of that, a, a division at full strength is how many men? 14,000 men. So yeah. they've already lost over 100% by the time they've gotten to this point. They've lost over 100%, but much more to the point, the 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 people at the tip of the spear, so to speak, yeah. the, the infantry platoons and the rifle companies, they probably turned over three times. You know, the, the rear area units had very little turnover, but the yeah. infantry, you, you know, the people in rifle squads, you know, they there wasn't anybody left by November virtually who had landed on D-Day. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we, you know, and we've started to talk about this, but Joe, maybe you can uh, kind of get into this a little bit more. Before this offensive, which is supposed to be the war winning offensive, when I was reading the book, um, the one word that kind of stuck with me as I'm reading about the lead up to this is exhaustion. I mean, what, yeah. what state is this division in as it's about to go into this attack? It was in it was in a very badly beaten up state, uh, yeah. and and part of you know look at the title of my book, <laughs> yeah. our tortured souls. It it's not a happy time, yeah. and some yeah. things happen in the next six weeks that, that definitely reveal that uh, you know when you're not winning, morale goes down the tubes, yeah. and certainly in this phase, uh, the the American army and you know all Allied armies on the front were simply right. not doing what they had hoped to do yeah. you know and 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 there were there were a couple of things that were very uh forceful had very forceful impact on the morale of the division that were new to the division one was the weather yeah. you know this is the first time the 29th division and all the allied divisions on the western front were experiencing a late fall European weather. I mean, it wasn't anything unusual about it, but it was soggy, it was wet, yeah. there was no sun. Uh, the other thing that was very different it, for the 29th in particular was the terrain. You know, yeah. this division, if you had watched the earlier shows that you guys had done with me on the division, had fought mostly in hedgerow country, the Bocage country, both in Normandy and in Brittany. Uh, and that, you know, is very claustrophobic fighting yeah. uh, terrain where you don't really see the enemy further away than 50 yards. And then abruptly they enter Western Germany and all of a sudden the battlefield looks like a, a pool table for yeah. miles and miles in which you can be, you know, you could be shot by a German machine gun at a range of over a mile. No place to hide. You know, no high ground. I mean, all the 29th Division veterans who I talked to uh, uh, when I interviewed them about this phase of the war said, forget everything about hills or any such thing as high ground. There was none. It was like a pool table and, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a duck walking on a pond waiting to be shot. shot. Yeah. And that that uh, terrain change was was a, was a shocker. And the and the third quick thing, and then I'll 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 stop. The third thing is they had entered enemy country, yeah. and you know I don't think they had taken into account what was going to happen when the German army strictly adhered to Hitler's uh, suicidal directive to not give up an inch of ground of the fatherland. It was taken literally. And every single village, you know, insignificant village of no particular military importance was defended almost to the last man. And the resistance that the German troops and supposedly not even very high quality German troops, the so-called yeah. grenadiers, which, you know, the American army at first derided as second rate troops. They, they changed their opinion about that very quickly. Um, the... The, as, as Eisenhower famously said, when somebody interviewed him and, and said, well, you know, what's going on? We're not moving, you know, with any speed and we're not, you know, approaching the Rhine as we had hoped. He said, well, the one thing that we didn't take into account is how ferociously the Germans were going to fight. Yeah. And, you know, the expectation was that they were ready to give, you know, in the, in the race across France. Uh, early September, the you know, in the highest reaches of the Allied command, British, American, the expectation was that they were ready to give up. Yeah. You know, look at look at what Montgomery expected with Operation Market Garden. It didn't yeah. come true. And that was the first writing on the wall. And um, Eisenhower said so much in a press conference. He said, we didn't think they would fight with this level of intensity. And this whole yeah. book is about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so November sixteenth, and they're they're all lined up. They have a they have their zone. I have a map here from your book, uh, and the 29th division is starting out on the left, which would be the west, and they are 
headed for the Ruhr River, which is the line on the right, uh, just before the German uh, town of Julich, which is on the other side of the river. And they have um, all of six miles, six miles, I think, to go to get to the Ruhr River. Um, uh, and this turns into a bloody slog and on day one. So, you know, what, wh how does it go so wrong so quickly? So many reasons. Um, you know, as I said, the weather was a killer. Uh, the American army had, was just getting used to the use of air power and effective ways, uh, but uh, the cloud, persistent cloud cover in, in late fall in Europe is such that you're not really going to get much tactical air support. And in fact, the November 16th target uh, jump off date for the uh, um, offensive that I discussed in my book actually was supposed to have happened a week before, but kept getting postponed day by day by day and because the airplanes couldn't fly. Very typical problem all across the Western Front until finally at the highest reaches of the Allied Command, Bradley said, we go planes or no planes. Um, I also discussed, you know, I, I, I don't like to make opinions in my books. I like to give you the, the readers the facts and I like them to draw their own conclusions. Um, but there is no doubt about it that one of the reasons why the the six miles that the 29th division had to advance did not go well were tactical mistakes uh misjudgments um uh, uh to a level where honestly the division commander general gerhard who we'll probably talk about was was about to be relieved he in fact he really was relieved but eisenhower saved his career and would not relieve him, even though uh, Gerhardt's army commander, General Simpson, said we need to get rid of him. Uh, as a microcosm, the opening day of the attack, you know, the 29th Division had nine infantry battalions and each one of them about 800 men strong. And just very curiously, nobody really understands why General Gerhardt only threw two of the nine infantry battalions into the offensive and left seven behind the lines. Big, big mistake in retrospect. Of course, it's very easy to be a Monday morning quarterback, but certainly didn't work. Um, the He didn't use tank support in the opening two days of the attack. Nobody really knows why. Possibly it was because the terrain was so muddy that he didn't think the tanks could operate. But interestingly enough, there was an armored division to his left that was using tanks. Um, the This failure in the first two days of the attack had absolute tragic consequences. Uh, you know, men were asked to move across these open beet fields. They were basically sugar beet fields with very low vegetation, moldering, decaying vegetation because it was November. And uh, it wasn't like a cornfield where a man could hide in. It was, you know, uh, eight inch high beet plants. And when the men were walking across uh, open fields of as much as maybe 1,500 yards in width uh, with heavy equipment and in the face of Germans very heavily entrenched in all those towns that you saw on the map that uh, you just displayed, Rick. They were like, uh, yeah, in fact, if you look at that map, the first target of the November 16th attack was the town called Searsdorf that you can see in the uh, left part of the center of that map. Um, the opening two days of the attack was uh, basically a massacre. Uh, you know, men advancing across that uh, open field between Baseweiler and Searsdorf were just cut down by German machine guns, not only from Searsdorf, but up north in that little village called Sederich, which we're ultimately going to see if you're going to show the film uh, that we talked about a little earlier. Um, uh, you know, the men couldn't move. They, they had to lie in these beet fields with no protection and uh, they, they couldn't advance. They couldn't go back. Their only salvation was to wait for darkness, which is what they did. And they, it, was a, it was a World War I style attack that made about as much progress as you might expect from having read about the Somme or Verdun. 
Uh, it was the American version of that, except it was the next war. Um, uh -huh. Anyway, um, it, it, it was uh, it was one of the examples of how the American army had not yet matured enough to figure out how to solve the problem of making set piece offensives that were really really tactically proficient now in, if we if you if you're very generous enough and can get me back for a sixth visit in my last book of the series i will give you a hint that the division and all other divisions on the western front did solve these problems oh, no, Joe, you're not you're not getting out of this we're keeping <laughs> yeah, you're, you for, <laughs> you're stuck for the long haul so yes we'll have okay well, then, in my last book the, the last book, time okay. Anyway, so that, that's it in a nutshell, Rick. Sure. It was tactically not good. The terrain was not good. The weather was not good. You couldn't get air cover. And, uh, and you know. And no tanks. Yeah. And no tanks. Well, but, okay. So, and I know you don't want to give an opinion, but we want to put you on the spot and make you give us an opinion. Um, you, you quote a battalion commander uh, talking about the start of this attack, and he, he blames it on screwy, the failure on screwy tactics, he says. And, and. I mean, shouldn't the 29th, shouldn't they have expected more of the 29th at that point? I mean, is it is is, it, is the failure things that they didn't foresee or is there something else going on? Is it the command? Is it the conditions? Is it, you know, because they've they're obviously uh, they're experienced at this point. I would say that it was, it, the, the, if you have to boil it down into a nutshell, it was the theme of our last History Happy Hour talk. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. You know, uh, the division commander, as well as every division commander on the Western Front, yeah, was yeah, yeah. overconfident that the German army was was beaten. They were not as good as we were. They, yeah. you know, we just need to push them, and they're going to crack, and it's going to be like the end of the of the Great War when finally the Germans did crack in early November of 1918, and we really expected that scenario to play out again. It really was a question of, uh, in, let's talk about the 29th Division specifically. General Gerhardt, the division commander, really felt that he that the offensive was going to reach. There he is in in his his famous jeep, the Vixen Tor, which it, again I'll point out I, I took care of in the museum that I ran for years. I took care of that jeep for almost three decades, so um, I'm very fond of that jeep. Um, General Gerhardt believed that he was going to race to the Roar River in a matter of two days, jump over the Roar and be on the Rhine uh, at General Bradley's directive within a month. And he really believed that opening day of the attack was simply going to be a leapfrog, uh, the beginning of a leapfrogging operation in which every battalion was going to seize a village and then a fresh one was going to jump over to the next village and then another fresh one would move on and that he thought it was going to be a game of checkers. But it turned out um, that the Germans were not only well entrenched, as you might expect in these villages, they'd had months to do so, but their, their um, surprisingly, their commitment to fight in this losing uh, proposition was, was very high. And, you know, again, if we can look at some films later on of, of the Americans capturing Germans, you'll be surprised. The Germans are not young men. Uh, they don't look like they're, they're, they're very good soldiers. But the American army learned that they were very um, uh, committed to adhering to Hitler's directive to fight to the last, to defend every inch of the fatherland. And, mm. and, and you know, whether whether they did so willingly or unwillingly, I don't know, but they did. But they did. And that, <laughs> yes, it did. And, and of course, you know, they were very, very well armed, you know, in a tactical sense, they were better armed than we were. They had better automatic weapons. Their army at this point had almost given every soldier, a, you know, essentially a version of what now, you know, an AK-47. I mean, the, the, pre the predecessor to the AK-47 was the... Um, Sturm Geschutz 44, which was a marvelous invention for its time, and the Germans were heavily armed with that weapon, and we were still using the old Browning machine guns, BARs, and the M1 rifle. We really had a little bit of a disadvantage there. So, 
Well, we've mentioned this film footage a couple of times, so I think we should take a look at it. And this was uh, shot by a Signal Corps cameraman named Donald Calamar. It starts, I think, about three days into the offensive. I think you're going to see a slate that has his name and has the date on it at the start of this footage. Uh, so we get to see the 29th and the territory they're in. Uh, you talk about this footage in the book. I know you're 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 very familiar with it. So so it's about four minutes here. Tell us a little bit about what we're seeing or the story behind it. Okay, this is actually the third day of the offensive when things started to get a little better for the division. It's when General Gerhardt realized that it was not going to be a leapfrogging operation of any simplicity. He decided that he'd better commit much of his division. And this film depicts the attack of the 1st Battalion of the 116th Infantry on the village of Setterich, which is up in the northern flank of the offensive. And it was the one that I had mentioned that was cutting down the Americans in the open fields at very long range. So the village had to be taken. Here are the tanks of the 747th Tank Battalion, the first time in the offensive that they were actually put into use. And there is the battalion commander of that first of the 116th named Tom Dallas. He's on the left with his radio operator, although it is said he didn't need a radio op. There he is. That's a great picture of him. It is said he didn't need a radio operator because his voice was so booming that he could give orders over a mile distance by simply by yelling. You know, this footage is actually not really recognized very often, but it, it's, at, it's very rare in that it is actual combat footage. If you look very closely, you can see the puffs of, of white smoke coming out of the machine guns on the, on the bow turrets of the, of the tanks. And you can see occasionally American soldiers flopping to the ground, taking cover. And uh, there you can see them shooting over those open fields. You can see soldiers behind the tanks. And soon you're going to see German prisoners with their hands up running toward the camera. There you see them. Um, this was really the first successful attack of the offensive, but it was also a precursor. They're, they're, com they're ger German prisoners coming in now. Um, it, was, it was a hint that getting to Ulick and the Roar River was not going to be a matter of days. <laughs> because every village was going to have to face an attack like this. Also note the, uh, note the bleak, you know, sky, note the waterlogged, if you, you know, there'll be some film, some footage where you can see the waterlogged trenches. Um, that's a good shot. Well, so yes, this is the unit. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. This unit landed in the very first waves of Omaha Beach on D-Day. Uh, but as I said, probably of the 800 men in the battalion, I'd, I'd venture that maybe 15 were D-Day veterans of the 800. Mm. So, uh, you know, any, and another thing, the, the cameraman of this footage was not a member of the 29th Division, but he had gained a silver star two days before by dropping his camera, running into the open fields on the opening day of the attack and rescuing several wounded 29ers in the beet fields. He became a legend in the division. There's his name on the, on the thing. Donald Calamar. He uh, gave a silver star, even though he was a, a very rare occurrence for Gerhardt to give a silver star to somebody who was not in the 29th division. So here are some prisoners. I'm not sure you can see it yet clearly enough. Well, they don't. They don't look too aged. They don't look no, too young. Not they that fella. Yeah. Well, it was. You know, it was said that the Volkswagen Adidas were either too young or too old. So I mean, we. You know, I'm. I'm. I'm not an expert on the uh, sociological makeup of those divisions, but they. They clearly were not first class soldiers, and and were drawn in to the army only after the uh, Allied race across France to form these divisions. Well, we'll we'll come we'll come out of that now. I think we can we can come back to yeah. ourselves. And Chris, we'll, we'll go no, back. But that gives people a good idea of kind of what this looked like in the early days of that uh, attack. So you yeah. say that you know 
you say that by the third week of November, so pretty soon into the attack, the, the, the division faces a crisis unlike any it had experienced before. So is the crisis specifically that the attack is breaking down or their tactics aren't working or what is what is the the crisis that they haven't faced before and how do they start to work through this? That's a great question. It's a crisis on many levels. As I mentioned earlier, when you don't have success, morale starts to deteriorate. And certainly every one of these attacks on inconsequential German villages that was that triggered dozens and dozens of casualties to no appreciable purpose other than moving another 800 yards toward the Ruhr River was beginning to have a very uh, negative impact on the morale of the soldiers. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a second. Secondly, mm -hmm. the weather. As I said, the 29th Division had not experienced fighting in the open in this kind of weather since they'd been in Europe. Even worse was the fact that the, from the directive of the commanding general, General Gerhardt, you know, it was a it was part of the so-called Division Bible that no unit of the 29th Division could ever set up a headquarters, be it a company headquarters or a regimental headquarters. No headquarters could ever be set up inside a house. Yeah, it had to be outdoors or in a in a tent. That was a rule, and they opened this offensive with that rule, and it was just kind of catastrophic. And the result was one of the greatest uh, crises that the division ever faced. That had absolutely nothing to do with the enemy. You've all heard of the ex the, the term trench foot. It's mm -hmm. mostly a World War One term you hear, but the 29th Division suffered grievous, grievous losses from trench foot. For every um, roughly two or three physical casualties they were having in battle, there was a man that fell out of the line due to trench foot. Yeah. And you know, trench foot, it, it, it's, it's a very, very simple thing. It doesn't have anything to do with the freezing temperatures. You can be outside even in temperatures in the lower 50s. But if your shoes and socks are immersed in water for a matter of hours, 8, 10 hours, and even if it's 50 degrees, you're going to suffer serious, serious foot problems. And if it went on for days, as it did, because nobody understood or nobody had prepared for this, these men were absolutely debilitated. They take off their socks and their feet were black. They had no feeling in them. If, you, if it was left untreated, they couldn't walk. Um, and, you know, ironically, it was actually considered a better deal to get trench foot than to keep on fighting in these attacks across the open fields. So a lot of men almost welcomed trench foot. Well, I was going to say, and I, don't want, I don't want to throw you off track here, but I mean, very often trench foot is an indication of a much bigger problem right in the morale of the unit and the and, and the condition of the unit right that's a totally great point chris it was had had them had the division been winning you would not have had this problem it's you know doc uh, uh, surgeons at all the levels of the army said trench foot was very addressable all yeah. you had to do was have a couple of pairs of dry socks and get the men out of the foxholes for a couple of hours, and you would have been good. And and you know the 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 senior surgeon general of the army in the, in the European theater, he he confessed that the army was absolutely unprepared for this. He said the army footgear is absolutely lousy. You know to think that we were going to go through a fall and a winter in Europe with the the shoes that we expected these soldiers to use, it was unforgivable. Yeah. But you're right. Um, the bottom line was that when you saw your buddies dropping like flies, making attacks across open fields against an unseen enemy with machine guns, you know, it was very easy to fall to trench foot and say, you know, I, well, I'll, I'll be able to go back and get five days out of the line. Yeah. You know, and that was, the, you know, it was a morale problem that was, it was the first time that the division had been hit with a morale problem in the in the, in since D-Day. I mean, a serious morale problem. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the story of the 29th is, is a bloody one, starting from D-Day, liberation of 
expressed and into uh, Eastern France, but I do definitely feel like the tone shifted here, whether it's whether it's you or whether it's the men in the unit, that there's increasing bitterness about the staggering losses. People are coming in to command companies. They're being killed hours later. Uh, bitterness among the soldiers, maybe bitterness uh, uh, in you as a writer. Gebhardt at one point uses the phrase German enthusiasm to describe the German counterattacks. And then you keep using the word enthusiasm throughout the rest of the book. And I could feel, maybe I'm wrong, but I could feel the rebuke there in your phraseology. Yeah. I think so because you know, I mean, it's I, not, I know it's, we, we're not supposed to get into opinions, but maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you were showing some enthusiasm for an opinion there. Well, I want to tell you that it was painful to write this book, and um, because I saw cases in this month or month and a half period that I write about in our tortured souls that were unprecedented in the history of the division, I saw men who had gained silver stars in Normandy in this November period, receiving orders to attack from their superior officers and saying, I won't do it. I'm just not going to do it. It happened several, several times. You had company commanders who received uh, an order to attack across a, an open field to seize another village after just having done it two days before and having lost 25 guys and then getting the same order to take another village that all it was was another 800 yards closer to Ulick. And they went into this commander's conference and said, I'm not doing it. And that's a morale problem because, you know, they had to do it because they got rid of them if they said I couldn't do it. And it happened many, many times. Another thing that was unprecedented, first time in the history of the division, you start to see men going AWOL. You know, you almost never in Normandy or Brittany ever saw an AWOL problem. Well, one exception, when the, when the trains went through Paris, <laughs> the way to Normandy, there was an AWOL no, problem. No, 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 no. Generally, <laughs> generally, that was solved, and the men somehow made it back to the division. They didn't really want to go AWOL, but they wanted to enjoy Paris. But this was a, um, this was a real AWOL problem. And then even one or two... You know, you read about this in World War I a lot, and in some cases in World War II, self-inflicted wounds. Yeah. Uh, you Very, very rare occurrence, but you you see a couple of morning reports with people being removed from the front with a self-inflicted wound, and that is the first time you ever see that in the 29th Division. But don't get me wrong. I want to tell you one thing. Yes, I had a little bit of maybe rebuke in me in the style that I wrote the book, uh, given the tactics that were practiced. But when you look at the performance of 99% of the men who were asked to do these things, they did them un with unquestioning duty, as, as fatal as it turned out to be, they did them. Yeah. And it's just unbelievable to me how they could endure. And yeah. and 99% of them did endure if they were lucky enough not to be hit by a bullet. Um, and that to me was, you know, one of the most impressive things. I, in, in the book, I talk about some of the great chaplains in the division. Uh, and one chaplain in particular, a Baltimore native, uh, Eugene Patrick O'Grady, who really you know, he just took the souls of the men in, into his heart. And in fact, that is the origin of the title of the book. Somebody referred to Eugene Patrick O'Grady as the man who soothed our tortured souls. Mm. And of course, I hate to say this, but Grady O'Grady himself became a victim. And on, I think it was November 25th, he was bringing coffee and donuts up to the front line. And he got uh, hit by a mortar fragment and was killed. And um, I mean, talk about a morale problem. He was the most beloved man in the 29th division. And when they held a funeral for him in Baltimore in 1948, when they brought his body back, that was that. And I, that's how, how the book partly ends. 
um, yeah. one soldier who was a mere private who had been taken care of by O'Grady, he said something like, I look forward to the day when Chaplain O'Grady will assemble his men in heaven for one last, mm -hmm. you know, one last embrace of his regiment, you know. And anyway, it, 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 it was, in the end, how the men endured is part of the theme of the book. Yeah. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna sne sneak in two questions. One uh, is from Charlie Burry because he's asked this question a couple times, and I wanted your answer on it. Um, uh, so, so Charlie wants to know what is the average percentage of replacement in the rifle companies versus combat veterans by this time? Well, it varied by company, of course. But if you if want an average rule, I'd probably say. Uh, 90 to 95 percent of the men in the well i'll be more specific in the rifle platoons yeah uh, because you know companies had men like cooks and and yeah. uh, uh clerks and things like that a rifle platoon had men just fighting men i would say in a rifle platoon 90 to 95 percent of them were replacements in in, in many cases a hundred percent yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah and i mean you know it, it is said it, in my next book that when some of the 29th Division units received the so-called, the very prestigious presidential unit citation, which enabled them to wear a special bar on their uniforms, General Gerhard said he wanted the streamer to be attached to the company guide on by a D-Day veteran. And he assembled all of the companies, and it turned out that most of the companies couldn't find a D-Day veteran. And that was, uh, you know, that that's a famous story in the division. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so, you know, we've, we've dealt with some pretty heavy things here and we've dealt with the state of the morale, um, uh, faulty tactics, uh, conditions they don't expect, et cetera, but obviously they do start to turn it around. Um, uh, and so let's start going in that direction. And I, I'll just call out, um, one village you, and I'll probably mispronounce it. I'm sorry, but you say outside the village of Durboslar, D-U-R-B-U-S-L-A-R, um, the division fundamentally changed how it fought a battle. So how did they fundamentally change how they're fighting their battles and, and how does that impact th their progress? Several ways. Um, they learned to, to be much, much more effective about artillery support. Um, they really were very good about using smoke. They had not really effectively used smoke to uh, obscure the view of Germans defending these villages. And uh, in preparation for attacks, artillery battalions, one of which was attached to every regiment, would absolutely lay a smoke barrage on that village that would cause it to be enveloped in a fog that didn't dissipate if the wind was not too bad for, for an hour. And you know, by the time that dissipated, the Americans were in the village. Secondly, the use of tanks, the, the 747th Tank Battalion, which nominally was not a part of the 29th Division, was very, very effective in, uh, in, in allowing the men to cross the open fields with some cover, providing uh, covering fire as the tanks moved over the open ground. Um, the other thing was, you know, leadership. The company commanders, which had, who, as Rick pointed out, oftentimes had just taken command days before because they were replacing somebody who had been killed, were learning the, the techniques were, could be improved upon. They were learning to envelop the villages and come at them from behind. But nevertheless, Chris, Derbyslaw represented, yeah, a, a watershed in this campaign, but the next two villages, uh, Borheim, uh, which is down near Ulick in the right, and yeah. above it, Oslar. Those two villages should be known. The names of those two villages should be household names to anybody who studies this phase of World War II in the Rhineland, because those two battles were among some of the most vicious, protracted, costly battles uh, that any division fought in in the western front in world war ii uh you know and i often tell people this the 
the the Hurtgen Forest. Maybe you guys have done a show on the Hurtgen Forest. I don't know if you have, yeah. but the Hurtgen Forest today recognized as the epitome of the frustrating, uh, costly, pointless fighting that didn't get anywhere in the fall of 1944. Everything we're talking about today was worse than the Hurtgen Forest, but never got any attention in the American press or by historians later on. Why do you and think that of, is? One of the reasons for that is the not army group to which the 29th Division was attached was actually a British army group. But the 29th Division was actually answering to Montgomery. Right. Uh, and the, not, the American army was actually a part of Montgomery's 21st army group. So consequently, I think a lot of American media types didn't think it was cool to be attached <laughs> to an army that was actually working under British command. Now that, that, that might be going out on a limb, but no, I don't. Know. Well, and we talked about we had a, a guest on just a couple of weeks ago talking about General Simpson, who was the commander of the Ninth Army. So that was above, above uh, the Corps commander, uh, uh, above um, uh, General Gerhard, but below General Montgomery, and he was not a particularly PR-oriented guy. He was a right. kind of a nose to the grindstone, get it done, you know, don't seek out a lot of uh, attention kind of guy. And that might have been a reason as well. Um, yeah. I wanted to just ask, though, about Kozlar. Um, it is actually a, a story that appears in the in the papers in the U.S. I was looking at a New York Times article about it this morning from that week in 1944. Um, um, uh, you get two, two uh, companies that are either cut off or surrounded, but Gerhard doesn't even want to <laughs> admit the use of the word surrounded. So can you talk a little bit about that action and also about his attempts and you know why he did this, I don't know, but why he didn't want anyone to even use the word surrounded, crossing it out of the official reports? Oh, wait, can, I, can I piggyback on that question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'd say, why wasn't Gerhardt relieved? Okay. Go yeah, ahead. so, okay, that was my next question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> put, put them all together. Go for it, Joe. Yeah, General Gerhardt, I mean, again, I've, told, I've, I've mentioned this to you in the past. Uh, I, I have very mixed feelings about him. He was, he was a person that, without question, brought a very special morale to the 29th Division. There are, you very, very rarely met guys... Uh, after World War II that had such a pride in their division as 29th Division veterans had. But his eccentricities were, you know, they were they were numerous. And um, among them, I've talked about in the past, the chin strap yeah. rule, you could have yeah. a $5 one if you didn't have your helmet chin strap book, which was absolutely hilarious to members of other divisions when they heard of that. Um, but among his foibles was the fact that he didn't allow terms to be spoken over radio or telephone communication that was represented any kind of negativity. And, and among the negativity was the word surrounded. Germans could be surrounded, but no 29th Division unit could ever be quote unquote surrounded. It was not allowed to be spoken. You could not say that the Germans counterattacked. As you said, Rick, you could only refer to the, the Germans were enthusiastic last night. <laughs> um, um, wow. and, and, and people lived with this nonsense, uh, and, they, and it was almost part of the, 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 what made the division uh, distinct. But as to Chris's question, um, in early December, when the division had still not pushed up to the Roar River and was still suffering tremendous casualties in the fights uh, at Hassenfeld Gut and the sports plots in Borheim and Koslar, General McLean, who was the Corps commander at General Gerhardt's immediate superior, had had enough. And he looked at the, at the statistics of all the divisions in his command, and he noticed that the 29th Division always had more casualties on a day-by-day -day basis, but had accomplished nothing in particular better than any of the other divisions in his corps. And I have the transcript of this. He called up General Simpson, who you just mentioned, Rick, and he said, I can't, I have to get rid of Charlie. 
and Charlie Gerhardt. And Simpson said, why? And he said, because I'm, I'm seeing casualties that are inordinate. It's, uh, they're intense and, and something is going wrong. I, I mean, at this rate, there's going to be no division left. And Simpson said, okay, if you think that has to be done, we'll do it. And uh, Simpson took that up the chain of command and said, we recommend that General Gerhardt be relieved. And, you know, there was also a, a lot, a couple of black marks against General Gerhardt already. Yeah. You know, he wrote okay. a house of prostitution in, uh, in Brittany that General Bradley noticed. And Bradley got very, very upset with that, even though that house of prostitution thing was grossly exaggerated. But also General Gerhardt had disappeared for 10 days yeah. when supposedly there was a furlough and there was no furlough. Anyway, he already was in the doghouse. So his relief looked like a natural, but it got to Eisenhower. Eisenhower shared one year on the West Point football team with Gerhardt. Gerhardt was the star quarterback on the West Point football yeah, team. Eisenhower dropped from the team and became a cheerleader at West Point football games. So I don't know whether that was played into it, but you know, well, Eisenhower it, said, we can't get rid of this. Don't mean a thing if you it was, got that ring. It was pretty unusual for him not. I mean, because the U.S. Army was pretty brutal in relieving division commanders for was. far less. So that I, um, all right. So Are you, you, I can I just piggyback yeah. also? But you said earlier in the show, you you said that for a brief while he actually was relieved. What? what tell me what you meant by that. Uh, I meant, but that Gar I'm sorry, that McLean and Simpson had sent the, the correspondence saying we, we I see. we're relieving we, him. We're relieved. Yes, and then Eisenhower simply said no. And again, I want to say that there's no question that Gerhardt was a fighting general. He, you know, he he may have done these things that caused casualties, but generally he accomplished what he was supposed to do. And you know, that was considered a positive trait. You know. It, Military leadership in World War II at this level was very tricky because all of these leaders had been majors only four or five years yeah. in the past. And to lead 14,000 men in the biggest cataclysm in world history, very difficult. And so you, 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 you had to be, you couldn't be too choosy. You had to take men who were willing to take this stress. And, and let's face it, they had to be willing to to in their psyches understand that men were going to get killed by the thousands and live with it. And he was one of those. And many generals, of course, had that trait. Yeah. Um, but can I say one thing? I know we're running out of time. No, no. One thing I wanted to say, since in my books, I always like to talk about, you know, not only the sharp end with the privates and the lieutenants, you know, and the field grade officers leading their men into battle, the majors and the lieutenant colonels. But I also like to talk about the perspective of the four-star generals and even the president. And in, the, and in my in my book, I also talk about Churchill and the decisions that Churchill and FDR were making. And I wanted to say that if you want to look to the real reason why this book is called Our Tortured Souls, you have to go all the way up to the highest reaches of the Allied leadership, and that is FDR, Churchill, Marshall. You got to remember that George Marshall was running a, a global war. He, he was the chief of staff of the U.S. Army, and he detected, and this is very, very sparsely discussed in history books these days, that after the liberation of France and the Low Countries, that Americans began to assume that the war was over. Yeah. Uh, and he noticed that in the in the in the you know early fall of 1944, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were leaving war-related work because they thought their jobs were done. Thirty percent of the Kaiser shipyard uh, works staff had left by September or October of 1944. Marshall realized that as he famously quoted in alluding to the 18th century conflict known as the Seven Years' War, he famously said, America as a democracy cannot indulge in a quote-unquote Seven Years' War. A king can do that, but in a democracy, the people have to have happiness. And these people in America, you can't keep them at these 
uh, war jobs and sacrificing uh, for very long periods of time. So consequently, he gave orders to Eisenhower, you've got to try to end this war in Europe by, by January 1st, and you've got to give it everything you can. And when that filtered down through Eisenhower to Bradley and Monty and McLean and Simpson, down to Gerhardt, in a nutshell, this is what happened in November of 1944. And it's also what, you know, coupled with the fact that Hitler had a much greater power over his people than we thought. When you combine that rush to end it with Hitler's recalcitrance, it wasn't pretty. So I want to leave it at that. Hmm. If that makes sense. That does make sense, Joe. Um, and I, I, um, I want to hit you with something completely out of left field, and I don't want to change the tenor of this. Um, but related to 29th Division, we had uh, a good friend of the show, Brian. He's an, an, a former 29er and a career MP. So I was going to try to slip this in at some point, and it really wasn't your name. But he just wanted to know, uh, being a 29 uh, MP, career 29 MP, um, is there enough information available to do a book on the 29th MP company? Well, number one, it was not a company. In World okay. War II, uh, U.S. Army divisions only had MP platoons. Okay. So they, they, they were a very, very small detachment of MPs. Now, in the modern U.S. Army, divisions have MP companies. Hmm. But no, in World War II, they thought that MP... Uh, administration was mostly going to be done at core and army level. So, you know, not really an answer to his question there. You know, there are after action reports by the platoon, but it really was a very small bunch of people. <laughs> okay. um, I mean, you could write about simply what you read in those reports, but um, not much in there. It was, okay. it was only about 60 guys. That's yeah. the answer to the question. Well, okay. we, 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 we've taken it from, from General Marshall down to the MP platoon yeah. in the last 60 <laughs> seconds of the show. And that seems like a, a great place to leave it. Uh, we have been talking, in case there's anybody in our audience who doesn't realize it, with Joe Balkowski, who is the author of the book, Our Tortured Souls, the 29th Infantry Division in the Rhineland, November to December 1944. It's a truly excellent book, part of a okay. series of five books about the 29th Division. They're all worth reading. Um, uh, you know, I hope we win the war. You know, that's still to be seen after we we go through through one more book. Joe, thank you so much thank for you taking so much, time to, to be. We'll play that animation one more time to be our first five time. Game. Yeah. You know, let me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, please have me back for the last book. The last no, we're going to. Oh, no, that's it. No, five, five's the max. No, <laughs> it's a Absolutely. much happier book. I promise you, much happier. We, we will All bring right. you back, and, uh, and but you're going to keep writing books, so we're going to have to keep having you back. So I don't know, you get like a fleece to go with your hat. Uh, yeah, I we, we started with a hat, folks, because you know we we don't want to get to when we have a ten time guest, and then who knows what we're going to do there. So um, that's I that's where your Patreon dollars go to support. <laughs> You'll get it. You'll get it. Thanks so much, Joe. Let's Thanks, go. Joe. All right. 29, Thanks, let's Joe. go. Fair All enough. Right. Uh, well, Chris, uh, uh, we are, we've been on World War II for a few weeks, but we're getting off of it next week. Are we? Uh, and we're going to bring back, uh, uh, I think it's only his second time on the show, but uh, bring back Jack Kelly. Uh, and he's returning with a new book, God Save Benedict Arnold. Indeed, God the true save story America. of America's most hated man. Yes. Yeah. Good meal. But why, yeah. So we'll, we'll have some interesting conversation. Hero, traitor. I put that there for you. <laughs> I know you <laughs> did. I know you. Because you. You. otherwise yeah. it would just be hero traitor. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's that, that's just the way it is. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks Please so subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Shout at us on Twitter. Listen to our podcast. Back us on Patreon and browse historyhappyhour.com. Thanks, everybody. Be safe.